Good whoa morning. How are you? Try to make sure I get everybody's attention first thing in the morning. I'm glad you're here. I hope you're glad you're here. If not, you should be. Let's all stand up this morning. Let's lift our voices together. Holy forever. I'm trying to think of the name of the song. <laughs> song of ages to the Lamb, and all who've gone before us, and all who will believe, will sing the song of ages to the Lamb. Your name is the highest, your name is the greatest, your name stands above them all. positions your name stands above them all and the angels cry holy all creation cries holy you are lifted high holy holy forever And the angels cried, holy, all creation cries, holy, you are lifted high, holy, holy forever, hear your peace. stands above them all. Your name is the highest. Your name is the greatest. Your name stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your name stands above them all. And the angels 
It is good to see everyone this morning. I do know we have several people away from us today because fall break kicks in. Uh, I've always considered fall break to be one of the worst things that's ever happened in the history of the church. I'm, I'm serious. Used to be, and Brother Don will vouch for this, October was always high attendance month. Okay? And so therefore, you'd have special days and really emphasize attendance as you got the new church here started. And then all of a sudden, we started having a fall break. When I was at Benton, I began to discover at Benton that when we had fall break, the people didn't come the week before fall break started to get everything ready to leave on fall break. And then they didn't get back until late that next Sunday, so they've already been out for three Sundays. And then they were just so tired on that Sunday following that that they didn't show up. And what you say, what are you trying to say, Don? I'm trying to say that a lot of people that took a fall break trip, they were gone for a month. <laughs> did I ever mention that to anybody at church? Yeah, I did. Did it change anything? No. But I did mention it nonetheless. That's why I've always thought it wasn't good. <laughs> I really wish they would cancel fall break and just have spring break like they used to. So that's my little pet peeve for the day, and we'll go on from there. So we are grateful that you're here today. And uh, we're grateful, too, to have people visiting with us today. You'll find some visitor's cards in the pews in front of you, and uh, there are guest information cards. If you'll take the time to fill that out, we would appreciate that uh, very much. As far as things for today, uh, we have a women's Bible study at 4.30 this afternoon, our men's prayer meeting at 5. Our evening worship will be over at the Family Life Center. We're having a chili supper, and uh, some people are preparing chili and some people are preparing desserts, and so we need to be getting all that stuff squared away. We'll meet there and just have a, a brief kind of devotional uh, in the midst of all that's going on there. So keep that in mind. And there's no Awana tonight. It doesn't resume until next week with it being fall break. So keep that in mind. Also, we, are not, we hadn't quite met our uh, Eliza brought us offering goal, and so we're still collecting money for that through today. And then we've got women's prayer meetings on Monday. You note the times there, our Hispanic Bible study on Tuesday. And then on Wednesday night, we're just having our regular prayer service at 6 o'clock. Also, we're going to be starting Children's Church, and Olivia Prince needs just a few people to volunteer to help her and assist with that. And so you can contact her about that, and they're planning on starting that on October uh, the 20th. Also, uh, keep in mind the senior adults not meeting this month. And if you want to use the church facilities, you need to get that squared away for the holiday season by October the 13th because a lot of times that's one of those months that really fills up fast. Also, we're getting ready and getting started with uh, Christmas, uh, with Operation Christmas Child. And with that being the case, we would like to encourage you just to read the announcement there. If you have any questions, you can talk to Shanna about that, but not this morning. You can't. Uh, she's away. Uh, we had band competitions. Lots of things go on this time of year, right? that have people pulled in a lot of different directions. So we'll be emphasizing that uh, throughout the month as well. I would also like to say a special word of thanks. Uh, Y'all probably don't all know this yet, but the church is making a contribution uh, 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 to uh, the disaster relief efforts in North Carolina. Uh, my daughter and her kids, if nothing changes, will be with us tonight uh, for our fellowship. They've gone to church this morning with our, with our uh, other daughter who lives down in Murray. And so uh, she'll be here tonight, but the church has made a, a donation to the church that she goes to because they have a special ministry. The church she goes to is called Biltmore Church, and they have like seven or eight campuses. Uh, there's thousands of people that attend in the various locations, and I think the church that they attend is over in uh, East Asheville, and it's, they run about 800 there. So this is a, a very large church, but they've de developed a ministry uh, called 828 uh, Strong, which is their benevolent ministry to help people in, in crises and need, and they are ve very well equipped to handle a lot of specific needs. Uh, they, you know, that part of the world has a lot of floods and things like that. I know for a fact that church has actually built two houses for two families uh, that lost in a, in a previous flood just about a year ago. And so uh, uh, there's so many different entities you can give to to make a difference, uh, but uh, the church has made a, a donation to that, and we want to say thank you. Uh, on behalf of our daughter uh, and our family for your generosity uh, and your kindness there. If you have your Bibles today, I would ask you to take them and turn to the book of Colossians. Our text today is Colossians 4.17, uh, but for our purposes this morning, I'm going to have us read Colossians chapter 3, picking it up in verse 5 and reading down through about verse uh, 17. 
Colossians chapter 3, uh, beginning in verse 5 and reading down through verse 17. God's Word says, Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourself of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Let's pray together this morning. Our Father, we want to say thank you uh, for the way your Spirit moves and works in our midst. We thank you too, Father, for uh, the kindness of your people and the generosity of your people. And I know the folks here in Mayfield and in Graves County and throughout our area know a lot about catastrophes and difficulties, uh, having experienced one themselves almost three years ago now. And with that being the case, once this happens, it makes us acutely aware of the needs that go on in other parts of the world because uh, we as a people know firsthand how all of these things are and, 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 and how terrible and, and devastating they are. Thank you, Father, uh, for the fact that you move upon people's hearts and minds and spirits uh, to make a generous difference to help other people. We thank you too, Father, for the fact that during this past week we've had those who have found themselves battling through physical difficulties. Uh, we continue to pray for uh, uh, Charles Bug as he had a procedure. We, we pray too for Kent Youngblood. We pray also for a number of our other members who are still recuperating from, from falls and from surgeries and things like that. We've got others, Father, in coming days who will also be having surgery. And we ask you to pour your healing grace and strength out on them as well. Father, we're also mindful, too, that throughout our world there is so much unrest. And, and we realize uh, that in Israel and in uh, Ukraine and in countless other spots on this planet, there is all kinds of a heartache and pain and difficulty going on and taking place. We do pray for all of these regions of the world. We pray if there's some way to find peace where the hostilities can cease, that would happen. Father, we know you're the God of peace, but we also know that there's not that many people that acknowledge you. There's billions on this planet and probably less than a billion of them even acknowledge anything about you. And with that being the case, uh, Father, we are mindful of the great task we have before us. That's why we thank you for the privilege that you give to us uh, to give to missions and to support other causes as well. Father, today, take, take our worship time today. Encourage us. Challenge us. Move us to serve you with our whole hearts. And Father, we pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand together again. Hymn number 140, Down at the Cross. <coughs> Down at the cross where my Savior died. Down where for cleansing from sin I cried. 
There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. I am so wondrously saved from sin. Jesus so sweetly abides within. There at the cross where he took me in. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. Come to this fountain so rich and sweet. Cast thy poor soul at the Savior's feet. <clears throat> Plunge into day and be made complete. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. Hymn number, hymn number 333, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day, Leaning on the everlasting arms, leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms, leaning, 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 <coughs> lasting arms. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms, I have blessed peace with my Lord so near. Leaning on the everlasting arms, leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Offertory hymn is in number 217, O oh, How I Love Jesus. There is a name I love to hear, I love to sing its worth. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest. 
glorious name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me, it tells me of a Savior's love who died to set me free. It tells me of his precious blood, the sinner's perfectly. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved me. It tells of one whose loving heart can feel my deepest woe, who in each sorrow bears a part that none can bear below. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved me. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us together here today to worship you. Thank you for all the blessings you've given us throughout the week. Uh, just thank you for each day. We pray, Lord, that you will be with the people that experience disaster, North Carolina, Tennessee, Florida, through that hurricane, Lord. And, and then also pray for people that are going through persecution and, and through wars and, and all the things that are going on. It's just, it just seems like there's just a whole lot, but we know you've got control of it. And, Lord, you can, you, they can look to you to comfort. Thank you for our church. Bless it, Lord. Bring it forward. Uh, be with Brother Don as he presents the message, Lord. Open our ears to hear what you want him to speak to, to us. Lord, thank you for this offering. Bless it in your name. Amen. Today our text is taken from Colossians, the fourth chapter, uh, and the 17th verse. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 17. I've actually spoken on this passage once before on a Wednesday night. I, I shared a little bit longer portion of it. But today we're just going to be focused on this one particular verse. As many of you all know, 
The Apostle Paul wrote a number of letters. He wrote a number of letters to churches. And then he also wrote a number of letters uh, to individuals as well. Sometimes in some of the letters that he wrote, he did specifically uh, mention people and call people by name. And the person we're going to read about today uh, is, is one of those people who we find mentioned uh, just in, on two occasions in God's Word. Uh, the first time, it's actually over in one of those personal letters that Paul wrote. Uh, it's over in Philemon, verse 2. There's only one chapter in the book of Philemon. And it basically says, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker. And then it says, also to Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home. And so in this particular verse, we refer to Archippus as being a fellow soldier. So he was one of those co-laborers or co-workers with Christ. And then the second time we find his name mentioned, we find it mentioned in Colossians chapter 4 and verse 17. Tell Archippus, see to it that you complete the ministry you have received in the Lord. Talking about a personal message in a letter, you know over in, in the book of uh, the letter to the church at Philippi, Paul mentioned two ladies that were having trouble and he addressed their situation. But here, he specifically says, Tell Archippus, see to it that you complete the ministry you have received in the Lord. One thing is clear. Archippus had been given an assignment, and it's pretty obvious at this particular juncture, it had not been completed or it had not been finished. Sometimes when you read something like this, you have trouble determining whether this is a rebuke or simply a reminder or a word of encouragement. But it's put this way, see to it that you complete the ministry you have received in the Lord. There are times every one of us finds ourselves having assignments given to us, either at school or on the job, or sometimes we have those assignments that God has presented to us and given to us. And there are times when that happens, for some reason, we just have a little trouble getting it finished. And so sometimes we need a reminder, right? Sometimes you just need somebody to say, okay, you hadn't finished what you promised you were going to do. And sometimes we just need a reminder. And other times we need something like encouragement, right? I mean, maybe we're going through some other difficult times and it just has us a little bit sidetracked. And with that being the case, we need somebody to come alongside of us and encourage us. And then sometimes in our lives, there are times when people have to light a fire underneath us to get us moving, okay? Okay? I think every one of us at times in our life have had to have somebody just rather sternly, how can I say it best, kick us in the seat of the pants. Now I remember when I was a kid growing up, getting kicked in the seat of the pants was not a crime. Okay? It wasn't a crime. I know it's a crime nowadays to get kicked in the seat of the pants. But every once in a while, you need somebody just to jerk you up a notch so you'll get something done, right? I remember one time I tried to jerk one of my daughters up a notch by reminding her that she was a Wilson. I mean, my father had used that line on me. I thought I would try it on her oldest daughter. And all she did was cry. <laughs> clearly, clearly that was not the way to communicate that with her, right? Right? So I had to find another way to communicate that with her, and I finally did. But unfortunately, I first tried that line, and all it did was provoke more tears. And that's really not what I was looking for. This is why there's different things that light a fire under us. 
And oftentimes we just have to simply discover and find what that is. As Paul found himself writing to the churches in those days, he often found himself reminding them of what they needed to be doing. And he even tells us over in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. This is Philippians 1, 6. Being confident of this, that he, being God, who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. So we know when God is doing work in us, he wants to do what? Bring it to completion. He wants to bring it to an end. That's what he wants to see happen. That's what he wants to see take place. That's why how we start is important, but also how we finish is important. And really today, I'm probably talking to you as much as anything about how, we, how we're going to finish. The title of today's message simply is, Finish Strong. Finish Strong. Because it's so easy to get sidetracked, go off on a tangent, lose focus about what it is that God has us doing and wants us to be doing. And with that being the case, there, there are times we've just got to be reminded to stay on task. Think about it this way. Let's say Jonathan was in full voice this morning, and this is the time of year he's not in full voice. And let's say he sang a four-minute song. And I mean the first three minutes and 45 seconds were outstanding. Okay? I mean, you were about ready just to jump up and shout, okay? Even here, y'all were ready to about jump up and shout, okay? And then he gets right to the end, and his voice goes all over the place. Now, what would we probably remember about Jonathan singing this morning, if that happened? <laughs> he didn't finish what? Strong. There's times we're not going to finish strong, okay? But in this life, God needs us to do what? To hang in there and to finish strong. It's, it's, what, it's like what happened in the Olympics this year in the 1,500-meter run. The two men who were favored to win in the 1,500 meters like, is like a mile run, a little bit less. But the two guys that were favored to win had had a tremendous duel racing each other for the entire four laps of this race. And there was an American by the name of Cole Hawker who was just hanging, hanging in there, running a little bit behind him, but hanging in there. And when they come to the final curb before they make the final straightaway, he inches up and is just about to overtake them on the inside when one of those great runners steps in front of him and blocks his path and he has to slow down just to touch. But as they made it down the straightaway, all of a sudden this other runner moves over just a little bit and Cole Hawker, one of the most unlikely winners of a gold medal this year at the Olympics, outruns the two fastest guys in the world at this distance to win it. And how did that happen? He didn't quit. And he finished strong. And that's what God desires for us to do in this life, okay? With his call to us, that's what he wants to see happen. First thing I'll say about this is God does have task for each of us. Every single one of us, God has something he wants us to do. And you see from Philippians 1, 6, be confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. But you slide over to the second chapter of Philippians, chapter 2 and verse 13, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. In other words, we have a God that's doing what? He's working in us and through us to accomplish his will, and he doesn't find himself quitting until we've got it complete and finished. Now, I think part of our problem is sometimes we say, well, I really don't know what God wants me to be doing. 
And after having listened to me to preach for 18 months, I think you ought to know what God wants you to be doing. But sometimes we're just going, well, you know, I don't have any abilities and I don't know a lot. And because of that, you know, you know, I'm just somebody just comes. No, you're not. Every one of us is more than somebody who just comes. Because God has things he wants us to do. And this is why we have a problem with this is because our focus is faulty. When we think about a task God has for us, we're looking for something big, okay? You're looking for a vocation. You're looking for some special thing he wants you to do that really stands out. When in reality, that is not God's primary focus in all of our hearts and in all of our lives. When you find yourself over in the book of Colossians and in chapter 3 and in verse 17, you pretty much find out what your purpose is. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. That means every day, throughout the course of every day, we're to do everything we do for God's honor and for His glory so He can get the credit and so we can express our gratitude to Him. This is what He calls us to do. He calls us every day to be conformed to the image of His Son. That is His plan for our lives. When you wake up in the morning, you don't have to wonder about this. You can know what God wants to do in your life that day. He wants to make you more like Jesus. That's his primary goal every day. And then he'll work that out in a variety of different ways through our lives because every one of us is just as different as we can be. Some of the things that he even tells us to do, you can find throughout this earlier part of Colossians 3. First thing he tells us to do to be a part of his will is to 3-5, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, whether it's sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, which is idolatry. He says this is the reason God's wrath is coming. A little bit later on, he even says in verse 8, but now you must also rid yourself of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language. Do not lie to each other. I mean, you can go right through the list and read all the things that should be put to death in your life that shouldn't have any forum or platform to operate in your heart and in your life. And then you get to verse 12, and you start emphasizing not what you're putting to death, but what you're supposed to be putting on and what's supposed to be apparent in your life. Therefore, as God's chosen people, here's what you're to be doing. Holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Sounds like to me we're putting on the fruit of the Spirit. An abbreviated list, but that's what we're putting on. And then he tells us to do this, you're going to bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has grievances against somebody else. And so we're told we're to be bearing with other people, bearing their burdens, helping them out. And then it says we're to be forgiving those people as well. And then on top of all of that, you put love in verse 16 on top of this, or verse 14, excuse me. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. And it doesn't stop there. Because then he says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Let me ask you this question. What rules in your heart? What rules your heart? Is it all the troubles and trials and struggles and problems you're going through? Or is it the peace that passes all understanding? Now don't get me wrong, we have to deal with all the struggles and trials and difficulties of life. But if all we ever do if all we ever do in this life is focus on all of our problems, we will miss out on what God wants us to do. Because the God who provides the peace that passes all understanding wants to sustain us and see us through those kinds of times. That's why it says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts since as members of one body you were called to peace and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing with gratitude to God 
in your hearts. Now, when we find ourselves focused on what it is that God wants us to be doing, which is becoming more and more like him in every single way, then he takes all the unique aspects of who we are and where he has placed us for us to make a difference in his kingdom. I mean, God always is in the business of working where we are, right here, right now, in our lives, to make a difference. We're in different families, we have different employers, we live in different neighborhoods, and there are special things that God allows us to be a part and do. This is all part of how God wants us to faithfully serve him. We make a difference where? Where God has planted us. That's the way you live your life, right? You, you make the most of the moments God gives you because you're not assured of any other moments, right? And for this to happen, we've got to realize God has a task for us, and the main task is for us to bring honor and glory to him. And as we do that, then he shows us how he wants to use the unique gifts that he's given us to help make a difference in his kingdom. There's a second thing I want to talk about, and it's this. God can enable us to resist the temptation to become sidetracked. I know Carol and I oftentimes drive to Paducah, and she worked in Paducah for a long time, over 25 years. And so every day when you drive into Paducah on I-24, and you look over to the right before you get there, you see some of the railroad yards, right? Those trains usually aren't moving. What are they doing? They're sidetracked, right? They're over on a sidetrack just sitting there waiting for the next assignment. God has a unique way of helping us resist the temptation to get off track. One of the first problems we have in this area is the problem of coasting. When, when, we, when I drive over here, when Carol and I drive over here, and we go off the ramp, off 24, going off to the road that goes out to uh, Trace Creek, and we cut back through this way, coming to church here, uh, sometimes, just experimenting, I just turn my cruise off and don't hit my brake. And if I've been driving 70 miles an hour, I like to see how far it carries me up, up the hill until I get there. You call that what? Coasting. How well do you coast uphill? How well do you coast uphill? How do you coast better? Downhill, right? You know, there's been a time since I got up the hill and I was still cl clicking about 60 when I got to the top where I had to brake. I almost want to say, you know, if I stopped right here and didn't hit my gas pedal anymore, I wonder how far I would go on 24 if I was just coasting till I stopped. And you say, you haven't tried that yet, have you? I said, no, I have not. <laughs> no, I have not. But I I've watched people coast before and there's been some times I have run out of gas and you have to do what? You have to coast. Sometimes in life, we like to coast. The only problem with coasting is there's times we get to rest sometimes, sort of like when you're riding a bicycle and you get to go downhill and you don't have to pedal for a while, right? And you don't have to pedal because, you know, you've got a good rate of speed going. That's why the temptation for us to coast in our spiritual lives and to not give a maximum effort is always a very real temptation. Sometimes, sometimes I think we like to put, or would like to put, our lives on autopilot, where you can just go do whatever, whatever you want to while your life is just continuing on. I, I've, I've discovered as I've gotten older, uh, coasting, and autopilot are two things I really have to battle. Because it's just real easy to coast sometimes and not really give the maximum effort that you need to. One thing we have to remember 
We may retire from our job, but you never retire from being a child of God. And you never retire from doing the things that he has called you to do and to find yourself working in those kinds of ways. So part of our problem can be coasting. Then there's the other problem sometimes that keeps us from finishing strong, and that's the fact that we just lose focus. We have this tendency to go off on tangents, right? It is called, in speaking terms, chasing rabbits. Okay. When you chase a rabbit when you're preaching is when you go off on a tangent somewhere that may have something to do with your thing, but it's just way off from it. That's why you really try not to chase uh, rabbits very much because you end up going down a hole with the rabbit and you're going, how in the world am I going to get back to where I was before? I mean, sometimes I've gone, man, where, Don, where are you going right now? This is not good. Sometimes this happens. And with this being the case, we have the tendency to lose focus. And this is why we, on a regular basis, need to keep God's truth and God's expectations before us so we don't lose sight of that. Then there's also the problem that sometimes we just approach things half-heartedly. Or let me say it another way. Sometimes we do just enough to get by. Last time I checked, God wanted us to love him with how much of our heart? Our whole heart. Which means we've got to be focused. There's not going to be any coasting. And there's not going to be any just getting by. Even before COVID hit, sometimes as I was talking with uh, Dr. Larry Purcell or Dr. Todd Gray, both of those guys who had worked in our area, of course, Todd is the head Baptist in Kentucky now. Um, sometimes they'd come by the office and see me and ask me how things were going over at First Baptist. And I'll never forget talking to them. They even said, this is before COVID, they said, Don, we're, we're beginning to note on a regular basis the commitment level of our churches is way down. And may I say, when COVID struck, COVID didn't do anything uh, to help that. Sometimes it appears that the world is winning, right? Because we don't seem to have that level of commitment that we once had. As I've gone back and studied things a little bit from the past, uh, back in the 50s and 60s and 70s when I was growing up, uh, people who were attending church uh, usually tended, tended about 85, 90% of the time during the course of a year. Keep in mind, there are 52 Sundays in a year, right? Right? How many Sundays do you have to miss to miss a month of Sundays? I'm asking the question, how many Sundays do you have to miss to miss a month of Sundays? One day. One simple month, right? Four Sundays. And that's what happens to us, right? That is what happens to us. We find ourselves... Before we know it, and I've, I've had people through the years say, Don, my mama or my daddy got sick, and I had to go help take care of them on the weekend. And I was gone for a month or two months, and then sometimes we were gone for a year or two before they either passed away or they didn't have to go take care of them all the time. And they said, and then the next thing I know, it had been 10 years since I've been in church, okay? Okay? This is what happens. Our, our commitment level can really ebb and get weak. That's why when, what we have to find ourselves doing is realizing that God, as I've told you all before, doesn't want to be one spoke in a bicycle wheel. He wants to be the hub. He doesn't want to be one book on your bookshelf. He wants to be the shelf that handles everything about your life. 
And he doesn't want to be penciled in in your schedule book. He wants you to take your schedule book and put it in his hand and let him lead and guide your schedule. This is what it means for him to be the Lord of our life. And our priorities oftentimes re reveal whether or not he really is our main or our primary focus in life. And then one final thing. God is as concerned, excuse me, about the way we finish as he is about the way we start. Archippus required a reminder or some encouragement or rebuke, however it was intended. And so he needed this to get him prodded to move forward. So my question is, what is it going to take for us to finish strong? Throughout the New Testament, particularly in the Gospels, it always talks about the fact that the one who endures to the end will be saved, right? It says that quite a few times, which means endurance and perseverance are a major part of what needs to happen and what needs to be taking place, which means in turn that we don't need to have one of those spirits where we find ourselves quitting or giving up. Endurance involves us finishing strong. Sometimes in life, even when we're not making very much progress, you just got to keep plugging away. You've got to keep being faithful to the basic things God has shown you. Because if you do that consistently, long enough, guess what's going to happen? We're told if you don't grow weary in well-doing, at just the right time, you will reap a harvest. Galatians chapter 6. And I believe that because it's in God's Word, but I also believe that because I have experienced that in my own life. Because a lot of times, not everything does fall in place like you want it to, and it's not easy. But what do you do? Do you just throw in the towel and quit? Or do you say, okay, God, You've been so gracious to save me. And God, I realize there's struggles that are going on right now, but Lord, I'm going to trust you to carry me through this time. And Father, you help me keep plugging away at it. Help me stay fixed and focused on you and on finishing strong. I'm so grateful for all the years God has, has allowed me to pastor. And I'm also grateful for the last six and a half years that he's allowed me the privilege uh, to be an interim pastor. And I'm telling you, he wants us to finish like we start, right? He wants us to finish strong. Since not a one of us knows the expiration date on our life, right? Nor do I want to know it. We've got to do what with every day that God gives to us. You've got to make the most of it. You've got to keep plugging away. You've got to stay fixed and focused on that which is going to make the greatest difference over the course of your lifetime. You know, a lot of times we use a bunch of different excuses for why we can't do those kind of things. Sometimes people will say, well, you know, I'm just too young, too inexperienced. And all that the Apostle Paul had to say about that was, don't let anyone look down on you in 1 Timothy 4, 12, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. And then one of the good things is sometimes when you get older, you start noticing the older verses in the Bible a little bit more than you did at a previous time in your life. And over in Psalm 92, verses 12 through verse 14, we're told the righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon. Planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the courts of our God. And then here's the good promise. They will still bear fruit in old age. They will stay fresh and green, proclaiming the Lord is upright. He is my rock. And there is no wickedness in him. Or a verse over in Isaiah 46 and verse 4. Even...
to your old age and gray hairs, I am he. I am he who will sustain you. I have made you. I will carry you. I will sustain you. And I will rescue you. And then just one more little verse for good measure. Over in Isaiah chapter 42 and in verse 3. A sermon text that I used once before here. A bruised reed he will not break. And a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth judgment. God doesn't want us to use age, being too young or too old as an excuse. Nor does God want us using the excuse we are too beaten or too broken down. Because if God can take a bruised reed, as we're told in Isaiah 42 in verse 3, if God can take a bruised reed and he doesn't break it, I mean, if we see a broken branch, what's the first thing we do to it? We lop it off. If, if we've got a candle burning in the house somewhere and it's down to where about all you see is a little flicker with the wick in the middle of melted, melted wax, what do we normally do? We blow it out. But what does God say? When we even find ourselves in some of these situations like this, he'll repair our brokenness, and it says, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In other words, our God wants us to stay faithful and true to him to the end. And he wants us to finish strong and to do that you can't give up you can't quit you've got to persevere and you've got to keep your heart and your mind fixed and focused on who on him what does god want us to do he wants us to finish strong what are you committed to in your life right now just getting by or finishing strong. As God's people, we need to be committed to finishing strong. Our invitation to him today is 308. 308. We do encourage your response today as we find ourselves standing to sing. Pass me not, O gentle Savior, hear my humble cry, while on others thou art calling, do not pass me by, Savior. Savior, hear my humble cry, while on others thou art calling, do not pass me by, let me at thy throne of mercy Find a sweet relief, kneeling there in deep contrition, help my unbelief, Savior, Savior, hear my heart. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Let me encourage you to come back tonight. We're meeting over in the Family Life Center and uh, enjoying a time of fellowship and then just a, a brief devotional as well. Father, thank you. Thank you for not giving up on us. Thank you for those moments we're bruised and broken when our 
when our wick seems just about to go out. But even then, Father, you don't give up on us. Help us not to give up either. Lord, strengthen our spirits, lift our spirits up, and help us to have a renewed focus on serving you with our whole hearts. We pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.